So I had five key observations, and I'll talk you through each of them, but they're but they really points for discussion. Some of them are, are not classically critiques of, uh, of the book, and incidentally, I should say that um, it's a, you, it, the book is a wor worthy read. Dare I say that it's almost readable in a casual sense. It's wonderfully edited, actually. So it's, it's, it's a really nice and well put together book. Um, and so I'm basing my comments more on, on, on reading that book. Um, the first is really to think about the manufacturing malaise and, and, and talk through some of the nuances, perhaps, that we can think about around this uh, Africa's manufacturing malaise, around which there's a lot of data. The second is to come back to the idea of the natural resource sector. Have we forgotten it in this sort of manufacturing uber alles? Have we forgotten the role that the natural resource sector can play? And then linking that, and I think there's something there possibly around what the value of the economic complexity approach, what value it can bring to thinking about uh, sectors beyond manufacturing. Uh, fourth is just to generate a little bit of debate, and it's a, a Roderick type point, as you know, is are we overstating the role that services can play? And it's more just a, a playful set of thoughts, really. And then finally, because I'm a Lambda economist, I've got to remind you that jobs do matter. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So this is the classic sort of story of uh, uh, sort of structural, the lack of structural transformation in sub-Saharan Africa. So we've got sexual productivity and employment over the period 97, uh, sorry, 75 to 2010. Uh, incidentally, I don't have it here, but the, the same graph for the same period for Asia looks incredibly different. But in essence, what you have is, of course, the, um, and if we have a little, is, is manufacturing over... Where is manufacturing? I can't even see it. Manufacturing over there. So low productivity, lack of employment creation uh, in manufacturing for 30 odd years in sub-Saharan Africa. But the structural transformation has been from, to some extent, uh, low productivity uh, agriculture to slightly higher, as the book puts it very well, slightly higher productivity, but not much higher productivity jobs in wholesale and retail. That's that big blob on the right-hand side. So those are the low productivity urban informal sector jobs, right? I'll come to that later, but when you think about services, we've got to be careful what we lump into that notion of services being, being the new option, if you like. But there, there's something else going on, and it links to the next slide, which is that, that little uh, circle right on the top there is mining. So what you're really getting out of mining is very, very high levels of productivity, but no job creation. And I want to argue that perhaps it's, we, we, we should not just be looking at manufacturing, but thinking about the opportunities that lay within mining with respect to uh, building complexity. Um, but the other point, which is more of a question for all of you experts, not really my area, is that I think, because in other, uh, uh, sort of other work that we're doing in other, uh, along with academics in other disciplines, in engineering, in sanitation, they think about manufacturing almost implicitly as the sector that can provide the spillovers naturally that other sectors can't. The expertise, logistics, infrastructure, and so on. And that's really a question I have, is whether we, we, we're thinking carefully about manufacturing in that way. But if we go back to the little small blob there, that's my second, uh, uh, my second key point, which is what about the natural resource sectors? So I put this graph up because I think it's really important. We talk about the African high growth story, the Economist article about seven of the 10 fastest growing economies post 2000 were in Africa. Well, all of it was the natural resource sector based. So this is a graph of the, all, the, all the economies on the right hand side of the red dotted line are resource dependent economies. And the 17 I've chosen are the 17 African lions, if you like, that they had the highest growth rates over the period 2008 to 2013. 14 of the 17 were resource dependent economies. So any growth story, right, any, any growth and development story for Sub-Saharan Africa has to be thinking about the natural resource sector. And I've just got two ideas there. One is, um, to what extent, when we code manufacturing, I think of some of the work that's been done by WIDA on uh, Mozambique, and we talk about manufacturing growth in Mozambique. Well, those are aluminum smelters, right? Last time I checked, those are, those are pretty capital intensive and it's downstream mining. So I think there's a, there's a story there about what we code as manufacturing, but what is really downstream mining. The other, of course, is, uh, you know, uh, arguments that have been made before by the bank and others that 
to what extent can, is there a growth opportunity or a growth and development discussion that we need to have industrial policy around using um, uh, revenues from commodity price booms in sub-Saharan Africa. So in fact, the story there may be really about proper governance and management of uh, natural resource booms within sub-Saharan Africa. But can we do something with, uh, with, uh, with the natural resource sector? And I want to argue that the notion of economic complexity, which I won't bore you with, is, is a really useful device for thinking about that. What I have here are the ECI measures, so uh, the economic complexity index uh, uh, mapped against uh, GDP per capita, and the blue dots are African economies. There are really two key points here. One is that for the same level of GDP, the leading manufacturers in sub-Saharan Africa, um, um, I think it's Morocco, South Africa, Tunisia, Egypt, Mauritius, for the same level of GDP, they are less complex economies. So there's something about the lack of diversity that we've got to try and explain when we think of high performing uh, equal GDP emerging markets relative to those high performing sub-Saharan African economies. Of interest though, but perhaps uh, that's, that's for, for, for John to look at and start a new project, is we, these are the frontier manufacturers. I think what's really interesting is that second group right, the, behind the leading pack of what I've called the sort of frontier manufacturers based on the ECI index, right? So it's an endogenously generated estimate are really, really interesting to think about. But why am I talking about economic complexity and spillovers and the natural resource sector? This is just one example. You've seen these product space diagrams, but this is a product space mapping for South Africa. And it's fundamentally interesting because there's all sorts of things going on there. There's so if you know this, the bigger the circle, the more dominant the export uh, share is in the basket. If it's a colored dot, it uh, means that we're exporting. If it's not colored, there's nothing going on. The merger towards the center gives you high-tech uh, exports, right? Services are not in here, of course. But what's interesting is there are all sorts of nodes, whether it's agriculture, uh, whether it's horticulture, coal leads to other sorts of uh, products and so on. And so the idea is, can one think about the natural resource sector as the generator of growth in African economies and therefore the sector you need to look at for the next frontier product, right? And that's the obvious uh, way to think about it. And I'll give you two examples. One is, um, and we're involved in a, a project, as I said earlier, with, with uh, scientists from other disciplines, uh, and it's a project on bamboo. And it turns out that bamboo is really good at growing in, uh, uh, on soil that has been destroyed by mining, right? So in fact, you've got all this unproductive, what we would call unproductive destroyed land, um, sitting in mining intensive towns around the region, right? And bamboo in fact grows really well. That's what the scientists tell us. Why bamboo? Well, bamboo can then lead to, and that's the product space story, lead you into treated wood, construction materials. And as I found out, has a sugar extract, which can be used to make ice cream, right? And so out of, out of the natural resource sector, you get these sort of uh, uh, potential capabilities, if you have them, of course, to move into other products. Uh, the classic is from mining waste, right, into fertilizer. And so, so what starts out as a discussion about manufacturing, I'm sort of pivoting and say, well, do we, do we not need to look at not just ignore mining, but actually look at the natural resource sector as, as, as an opportunity. My fourth key point, and I think I'm, uh, Carol's keeping time, I've got two minutes. For, fourth key point is, again, like, like I said, let's just, uh, let's generate a little bit of debate. Is our, do we really understand the services story? I have a few uh, uh, points there about thinking through it, right? I mean, um, so we, we've argued that, that manufacturing is not what it used to be, uh, and it's, it's really about services, right? So my second bullet point is really not a question I don't think we can answer alone. I think we need engineers. I think we need uh, all sorts of other scientists to tell us technically, from a technical perspective, can you actually build a dynamic uh, export-orientated services sector without building the capabilities that come with manufacturing first? And I don't have an answer, but th that may be worth debating. Um, and I have arguments there that, that are bubbling in my head. I mean, it's, it is manufacturing gives you road infrastructure, rail infrastructure, logistics, cold storage, right? And I've got a little bit of a, um, a 
hope nobody's from Rwanda here, a little bit of a dig at Rwanda, is that can you really build drone uh, capacity when you can't transport milk from one end of the country to the other, right? So there's a question mark there. And, I, and I, I've used the, the great economist, Roderick, to, to buffer my points there, um, where, as you know, from the Africa Growth Miracle uh, paper, he argues that he doesn't see services as acting as an escalator for, um, uh, for, for, for Africa's development. Just finally, um, is, it, uh, is there a false dichotomy? I think there is between manufacturing versus services uh, versus mining. I think there is. But, uh, but, but sometimes one wonders whether we shouldn't be sectorally living across all those different uh, sectors. And, and I would argue maybe the economic complexity framework offers that. But this is just, for me, it's always a stark reminder of the challenge, right? These are UN population uh, database projections of the African workforce. The right-hand side of the table is really important because what it suggests, if you just look at the percentage changes, that's easy enough, right? Uh, but it's for sub-Saharan Africa relative to the world. But that percentage there, right, 37.3, means that by 2100, close to four out of 10 workers on the planet uh, will be African. And in many ways, just brings home the point that if you're not going to think about jobs and a development strategy that's at least got labor intensity or job creation as part of it, I think uh, we've got a huge, huge challenge ahead of us. Okay, thanks. Thank you.